one of the legends of all time of our great game. And a tremendous atmosphere here at the MCG. Roy West kicking in towards the centre. Roy Sarr! Yeah, the knee, you're not talking. But you and me, I'm Welcome back to the show. And our next... Yes, Joe, I told you not to buddy uh, myself. Excuse mate. me, this bloke's just had his fourth pie. Graham Bond, the 3 your stats man. Unbelievable. Bondy, what do you think of the pies there, mate? They're terrific, Rex. I'm just trying out a new diet. That's the one you gave me with uh, 16 pies a day. I'm sure that it's going to help my Please waistline. Please don't tell Lynn how many pies I had at the night footy last night, mate. Graham Bond, I tell you what, who would ever forget Graham Bond coming on in the 1969 grand final, Tommy Hafey. The game had to be won and you sent Bondy out and he kicked a goal. Beautiful, yes. Uh, was beautiful. I remember, remember very well, and you were the same. Yeah, well, I didn't kick a goal, but I was 20th man. You did the right thing and gave me a, a run 32 and a half minutes into the final quarter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Tommy. And reckon I'm going to get uh, get even with this guy. He made me run up sand dunes at Portsea. But our next, up. <laughs> I tell you what, Tommy Hafey, I've got a marvellous surprise for you because coming up is one of the great players of the golden era of the Richmond Football Club, he is generally recognised as probably the greatest setter half forward ever to pull on a boot in the game. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm Melbourne welcome for Royce Hart. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, Royce. You recognise this guy behind you, Tommy Hafey and Kevin Bartlett, hey? I agree with you with the sand dunes, Rex. <laughs> <laughs> the sand dunes, you, you're a pretty good trainer, though. You weren't like the whale and me. No, but we had to. Someone had to hold the candle up. The stories that we read about you when you first came across and Graham Richmond took you down to Ben Alexander's and got you a suit and a couple of ties, are they all true or is it over-exaggerated? I can recall that story very well because people often ask me about that. Graham Richmond came across to see me play and I was working in the Commonwealth Bank in Hobart at the time and my mother said, he hasn't got enough clothes. So Graham said, I'll give you six shirts and a suit. And I took it. <laughs> what a fool. It was fantastic. I was interested in uh, reading a bit about you the other evening that you were a rover for the Tasmanian junior side and, uh, and all of a sudden you've, you've played in the most difficult position in Australian football. And I think that helped. I think a centre half forward not only has to take marks but be able to recover because there's a lot of pressure on a centre half forward when the ball's punched away. And being a rover for the first 15 years of my football career, it certainly helped. Yeah. Now you were paid the unbelievable fee uh, in 1969 of $2,000. I think you were in the army. You were like me, you, you went into the army, you started off slowly, then you completely slackened off. <laughs> but and wasn't God the, help us if there was a war. But wasn't the country <laughs> safe when we were there? Well, I don't know about the country, <laughs> mate, but I tell you what, uh, it was the greatest waste of time, and the bloke that uh, conscripted me, I, uh, I don't know what, I won't say that on live television, but you did play across there for Glenelg against Sturt, but you went bysies. Yes, I did the first five minutes of the game. I had a hit in the back of the head and woke up about 10 minutes later. But I had to play on though, Rex, because $2,000 was a lot of money in those yeah, days. Yeah, it was. And uh, I felt obligated to play for Neil Curley, the guy that was on before. He was a coach of Glenelg at the time. And you can imagine me going off and taking $2,000 with Neil Curley chasing me. If you ever sh uh, shook hands with Neil Curley, it's like shaking hands with a barbed wire fence, isn't it? Why are they calling him Knuckles? Well, he's punched so many people, I <laughs> suppose. Amazing. But they were great years. You could see then in the after-season uh, games we played against Glenelg and Norwood and these sort of sides that Adelaide, sooner or later, had to come into the national competition. They're just fanatical over there. Well, sooner or later, had to make good players for the VFL at that time because Malcolm Blight, Blight was about the first one that came across and was really successful because West Australians and Tasmanians were coming across here and doing well. Yeah. But South Australia didn't have the players in those days but now they've got some fantastic players. Of course, Carlton and Richmond in the 60s and 70s were head-to-head. -head. I think they played four grand finals against each other. You had some great confrontations with Bruce Dool. He doesn't say much. He's not like the bearded burbler who's not short of a word, but he doesn't say much, but what a magnificent player. Well, he's the opposite to you. He looks like you, but he doesn't talk like you. Doesn't he really? No, he certainly doesn't. But he... I can recall Bruce Dool when I first started playing on him, being a player that would get half a dozen kicks himself, a very defensive player, and he'd limit you to a half a dozen kicks and he'd mm. do his job. But as the time wore on, Bruce Dool became a very attacking player and would have his 10 kicks and 15 hand passes and set up moves. So he, I thought when he retired, he was playing better football than yeah. he was when he started off. One thing about the success of those Richmond years is the way people have gone on in their business and private lives, singing the praises of the start we get at, uh, at clubs like Richmond. Some of the great players Tommy Hafey turned into weren't so great when they came to Richmond. He had that knack of binding people together 
into a team situation. I'm sure of that, Rex, but I think one of the reasons for that, I'm sure Tommy had a lot to do with it, but we had players that came through at the same age group. We probably had the nucleus of eight to ten top-line players that stayed there for ten years. Yeah. And even though we're adding players from other clubs, the nucleus was always there. This man was a great leader, folks, I can tell you now. Captain of two premiership sides for Richmond, played in four. In 1973 against Collingwood, we, the Tigers, were down and out. But the little t-shirted Tommy, who rows a boat now, he made the move of the season when he brought on a young number four. Richmond, if they'd have got another goal and got, you know, less than four goals, might have come right back as we see Jenkin up high. It's taken by Sheedy. Sheedy, a hand pass over the top to Sproul. An awkward bounce is taken by Sproul. Stupid play. Ridiculous play by Adamson on that occasion. No future in those as we see Richmond now having a shot within oh, scoring distance it. and the player to take it, Richmond skipper Royce Hart. Hart coming on at half time to replace Robert Lamb. Hart 25 metres out directly in front. The kick, full points. Feel sure that uh, Lee Adamson might get a message not to make things quite as blatant as that one. I don't think he'd need the message, Bob. He's an experienced player. He'd know. Collingwood 11-8, 74, Richmond 6-10, 46. And we are 11 minutes into the third quarter. There's a Richmond runner out now. Obviously rallying his boys. Richmond fighting their way back into it. True Tiger spirit. Bounce of the ball. The Magpies are still there in front, however. Up goes Jerka Jenkin. Couldn't get a clean hit away. Taken by Francis Burke. He just couldn't get it with Jenkin. Comes through like a train. Picked up by Max Richardson. Max Richardson off Collingwood. Into the forward zone. Thompson a little behind his opponent there in McGee. But the ball handbars to cross here towards Thompson. Thompson pushing the ball in front of him. This it's there. Francis Burke comes in. Kicks it off the ground. In comes Hunt. Can't quite get the run of the ball. Big hers like a big giraffe. Just can't get down there. Could have been a free kick Richmond's way. It will be a free kick Richmond's way. You saw that. Our Channel 7 cameraman is smack on as usual and Wood to take it. Wood almost in the back pocket on that outer side. His kick travels up towards the wing. The players set themselves. Jenkins comes through and he was going. No doubt he was going. But he knew he was going right into trouble had he continued. Thompson calling for the ball. He's got three on the board, Tomo. Kick them in the first quarter. Kick from Jenkins is wide. Goes over the boundary line on the half forward flank on that outer side. Magpies kicking down to the outer or Richmond end. Heard. And the green go for it. Taken by Sheedy. Sheedy's kick is a hurried run up towards the centre. And a good mark has been taken there by Oborn of Collingwood. Been a very effective player today. Oborn's kick down into the forward zone. Plenty of Richmond defenders there, and Fowler cutting across takes a timely mark. Collingwood have just got to tighten up a bit, or this game will get right away from them. A chance for uh, the ball to be relieved now as it's kicked down into the forward zone, and it's called play on. Although Callaghan came through. And it looked like a mark to uh, Collingwood from up here to Atkinson. A kick off the ground now, and the ball will be brought back. And Fowler given the free. Uh, Bob, this is a different Richmond team from the one we saw in the first quarter. It would need to be, Mike, as we see Fowler put the ball forward. Jenkins was up high but couldn't take it. It's punched forward by Adamson. William Mouth misses the ball on the first occasion. Now gets a hand pass forward to O'Callaghan. O'Callaghan's kick up the ground. Bissett can't quite get to them before it bounces. So too Francis Burke tries to. Gets a hand pass towards Fowler. Fowler on to Green. Green gets his boot to it as he drives it down towards centre half forward and Royce Hart. Hart's blocked over by uh, Big Roberts. Well, Carter comes out, it's Grant Cranich, who gets blocked over, it's Cranich to touch. Oh. Too long as O'Callaghan gets held, and Carter gets the free kick. Carter goes on quickly looking for Balm. Balm's down there, Roberts in front, it's punched away by Clifton. Comes back towards Hart, Hart's for there, so too is Stewart. Stewart picks it up, a left foot towards goal! Full point! Fantastic. A great goal by Stewart, his first, and that takes Richmond to less than three goals now as they go to seven goals ten with Collingwood on eleven goals eight.
a remarkable fight back so far by Richmond. They've really shown that they've got what it's made of. Oh. Talk about a gutsy performance from both sides. But Richmond so far in this third quarter are just showing what finals are all about. They never win them till the final siren. There's Green now setting them forward once again. Hart comes out, the ball goes over his head. Adamson's there, Sproul comes in. Adamson gets it across here. Cranage puts it to the wing position on the member stand side. Francis Burke knocks the ball clear. In comes Wayne Walsh, almost takes the boundary umpire with him. His kick up towards the partner there. And it's Neil Baum. Baum's kick too, and he dragged that down in no uncertain manner. Barn would be about 30 metres out, kicking up to the scoreboard end. 11 8 to 7 10 at this juncture. What will it be after this kick? Oh, it's true, it's right through, no worries. A real pressure goal, Mike. Collingwood now, 11 8 74 to Richmond, 8 10. 58. Oh, Bob, what a comeback. Uh, one of the greatest fighting efforts, one you could ever wish to see, Mike. Only 16 points now. 16 points as Richmond, six goals down at half time. I can't believe it. reduced the leeway by halfway, and we're only halfway through the quarter. Who knows? Look at the pressure on in the centre bounce as we see Big Jenkin and Mike Green. Jenkin up high, but too early. Goes across, it was taken by Max Richardson. He gets a hand pass to Dean, but he's filled it. It's taken by Wood. Wood swings the ball back into the Tiger territory again. Hart comes across, forces the ball down. Bruce Hart picks it up, he swings around. A long kick by Hart. It's through again. And the Tigers have kicked another one. As they bring up Bruce Hart's second goal for the quarter. And what a lift Hart has given the Tigers. Just threw the out on the ground as Richmond go to nine goals, ten. Collingwood on 11-8. Well, they talk about inspirational captains, Royce. It must bring back great memories of those golden years. Certainly does, and I remember that game quite clearly because, as Tommy will recall, we had to win the last five or six games in a row to even get into the finals, yeah. and then to be in a preliminary final, down by seven-odd goals, and then to come onto the ground in the third quarter and get back into the match it was a great thrill i'm sure our footy fanatics would notice that we had the center diamond which was soon to be replaced by the center square graham bond our stats man 1969 premiership richmond richmond wingman has got a question for you royce yes royce so when rex came on air today he did mention a story about some handcuffs and i can remember back in our younger days at tigerland that one young constable happened to leave his handcuffs lying around one night could you tell our guests here just what happened that night Yes, I can recall that. It was over at the MCG <laughs> with uh, Rex had left his handcuffs around. I don't know what he'd been doing during the day, but one of the boys got hold of the handcuffs and they handcuffed him to the turnstile at the MCG and left him there for half an hour. Recall that, Rex? It was half a day. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Where are you getting all these stories? Well, I saw Tony Hainan over there. I played my first game in round seven of 1968. Tommy didn't want to ease me sort of too quickly into the game, but Tony Hainan looks younger now, have a look at this, uh, ladies uh, all around the nation. Gee, you're a good-looking fellow, no, you're Tony. Hey? <laughs> You've got a question for Royce Hart. I tell you what, you had some great confrontations with the champion. Yeah, every time we played against the good old Tigers, Smithy always seemed to put me on uh, Roycey. But, uh, yeah, we had some good fights out yeah. there. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Isn't that good to see Tony Hannon, eh? It is good because this is what I think football misses a bit today with all the money that's coming into it, that players don't seem to have the comradeship that we had. We didn't play for much money. In fact, I can recall in 1967, at our final pay night, and Kevin Bart will recall this, Fred Swift going to the late Ray Dunn, who was president of the club, saying it was 750 odd dollars for the whole year. Fred Swift saying that you've got the decimal point in the wrong place, Ray. <laughs> they were fantastic days, I can tell you now. In that particular game in 1973 that had to be won, and Richmond went on and won the grand final against Carlton, the little man himself with no hair. KB, well, have a look at these two goals. It was vintage 400 game stuff. Thompson, a big kick record.